Spirit of God, we pray to you as one who is more than we can now see. With all that we have brought into the doors with us this morning, we pray that you would speak to us with your life-giving words. For the sake of your new humanity, we pray. Amen. Good morning, everybody. I recently viewed a photo exhibit at the Huntington Art Gallery called A World of Strangers, Crowds in American Art. As the curator James Gleason describes, crowds are the temporary groups that strangers form. They take shape at baseball games, concert halls, subway stations, piers, at patriotic parades, and in angry riots, to name a few. This exhibit explored these crowds from the 20th century to today, not just as objective realities, but how artists have represented these masses of people through their photographic perception. Crowds can be joyous, destructive, or somber, he says, by rendering people as patterns of dots, murky silhouettes, or river-like currents of cars these artists create a form of abstraction that erases individuality and tames the crowd's restless energy. In the gospel reading today, Jesus says words that for me are some of the most stirring in all of scripture. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, she will guide you into all truth. So we might say that a spiritual person is someone who is a voracious student of reality or a seeker of truth and meaning wherever it may be found, across cultures, in the pursuit of justice, in psychology, in art, in science, politics, in social media, sacred text, and mystical experience, and on and on. Today is Trinity Sunday. Last week, I said to Gary Hall before the service, Gary preached last week. I said, Gary, you know I'm on next week, so it's your job to tee me up. And he laughed and said, ah, Trinity Sunday, the graveyard of preaching. (laughs) Good luck explaining the Trinity, he said. So I take this challenge on. Here we go. So the idea of Trinity is not explicitly in the Bible, and it took three centuries for this formulation to emerge out of reflection and observation of reality. This idea of three beings comprising one God doesn't make logical sense, and it's impossible for three physical things to exist in the exact same space. Yet what you might find fascinating is that in the realm of music, three musical notes can inhabit the exact same audiological space. And when played together, it's called a chord, which is a more beautiful and whole sound than a single note. So I give you the Trinity. My work here is done. (laughs) Thank you, James. Well done. (laughs) But there's more. There's more. There's a term in the early church in the fourth century um, used to describe the Trinity, which is perichoresis. Some of you have surely heard of this word before. This refers to a divine dance. Perichoresis envisions God not as a bearded old white man in the sky, but as a community of diverse beings dancing in shared equality, mutual love, joy, and respect. And this dance is not something up there somewhere in the heavenly realms, but the divine movement and flow is present among us if we can feel its pulse and hear the sounds. Now, this seems a lovely but abstract idea until we experience it as the shape of reality that we can actually tap into. Artists and creative people especially know what this is like to tap into this flow. So today, holding the perichoresis in our imaginations, the central question I want to explore is the relationship between Trinity and the different ways that we experience community. Community is a word that we use very often, but rarely is it unpacked 
and explored. The crowd exhibit that I referenced earlier raises a central challenge in human experience of loneliness and isolation and the quest for human connection and intimacy. People may be physically close together, but relationally could be miles apart. Yet I invite you to look not primarily at the problem I just described, but instead the positive movement inherent in crowds, that is for people to spatially draw near to one another. Where might this basic affirmative movement take us? I mean, we're a crowd gathered together today. In 2004, a young, shy, introverted college student was trying to find a way to connect people together across the Ivy League campus that he was on. And using the internet as a platform, he created a system where 12 to 1,500 people signed up within the first 24 hours. Originally, this network was called The Facebook, but it quickly evolved to the more simple and elegant title, Facebook. Maybe you've heard of this before. This is such a fascinating realm of human inquiry where more than one billion people are now active. Find a way for people to present to the world their most sexy and representative selves with an online buffer as a starting point. And what results is an explosion of connection of previously invisible realities of relationship now made visible. You have this mutual friend and this mutual friend and on and on truly remarkable. And this is not to judge any aspect of social media as good or bad, but to be aware of the different dimensions involved and to raise consciousness for how we use the mediums we use. Perhaps, especially to ask the question, anything I post on Facebook, am I willing to say to somebody if they are in the room with me? And we might especially apply this filter to our comments in regards to the election cycle right now. But I digress. Um, where does this electronic communal impulse take us if we keep going down the rabbit hole? In terms of human community, I've heard it said that Facebook is like playing one string on a guitar where there is a whole chord to be played. And not only one string or one chord, but a sequence of chords, which could even comprise a song, and which, if we're brazen enough, may even give rise to a dance together. I don't know about you, but I've never danced through a screen before, and I don't think it would be very pretty. The one string is utterly important, but an inadequate substitute for the whole song we are made to play as human beings. Friends, they were in a room together on the day of Pentecost when the winds of the Spirit blew and the fire of love burned afresh. They were in a room together when there was astonishment at understanding each other across race, culture, language, and ethnicity. Henry Nouwen writes that real hospitality is not to change people, but to offer them space where change can take place not to lead our neighbor into a corner where there are no alternatives left, but to open up a wide spectrum of options for choice and commitment, to create a space where strangers can discover themselves as created free, free to sing their own songs, speak their own languages, and dance their own dances. It's a beautiful description, but very challenging to live out, especially on Sunday mornings. I recently began leading the Eucharistic prayer in Spanish for the 1 p.m. community, which is an exhilarating experience for me that I really worked at with good coaching from Antonio Guiardo, the pastor of this congregation, and others as well. Wading into this new challenge, I am humbled at how much I don't know in the language and in the lives of the people I commend all of you to visit the 1 p.m. community from time to time. Come on the first Sunday of the month for the bilingual service. There is a saying in this community that once you get close to the love present, that you won't want to leave. Could it be that a central part of the more that Jesus talks about 
is encountering God and diverse others that we wouldn't otherwise make the effort because it's too difficult or there seems to be too many barriers. My five-year-old son plays t-ball right now, and it is as fun and adorable as it sounds. On his second practice this year, we were walking towards the field together, and he said in his sweet five-year-old voice, Daddy, there are seven brown skins on my team and two white skins. He being the blonde, a blonde-haired, blue-eyed, was one of the white skins, in case you were wondering. Now, what would you say? Come on, what would you say? In that moment, I felt some member of the Trinity say to me, this is an important parenting moment. Don't screw it up. <laughs> so I paused and I said, yeah, Josiah, people have all different skin color. That's called someone's race. Isn't that wonderful? And he paused for a moment and he said, yeah. And he ran ahead into practice. And I thought, wait, wait, there's more. I need to teach you. This is a moment. And then I heard another member of the Trinity say, chill out, that's it. There's nothing more to learn at this moment in his five-year-old world. Don't give him anything to unlearn. Across the ages, the impetus towards diverse community always begins and ends with relational proximity. Now, finally, I draw your attention to the image in the service order today. Go ahead and take out your... Um, service order. This is a sketch of the Trinity by William Blake. And if this room were a bit smaller, I'd like to ask you, what do you see? But a few of my observations. Spiraling down into more hidden reality, I see an artist's perception of a small crowd of three in deep time. I see human intimacy. I see the perichoresis wounded. I see suffering and suffering relieved. I see the profound need for physical human community in moving through life's patterns of death and resurrection in the many forms they may take. I see the possibility for a dance to be restored. Honestly, this image makes me uncomfortable and another part of me cannot turn my eyes away. Could this be a window into a deep communal energy of love that we are perpetually drawn into? One author I've read recently, David Tacey, writes, there is more to life than what we can see at the surface. There are vast swirling depths which underlie our existence and constitute our hidden nature. Some of us prefer to leave these depths to poets and prophets. And as T.S. Eliot reminded us, that humankind cannot bear very much reality. Resonant of Jesus' words. Indeed, these depths are shielded for many of us so long as all goes well and we adapt successfully to society and its conventions, where we may have the advantage of a relatively smooth running life but we will also miss a great deal of its meaning. For while the depths are dreadful and frightening, they are also beautiful and sublime. If we do not face them, we miss out on most of life. I know someone who's in the 12-step community who is talking about her relationship with her sponsor, the one who cares for her, and her sponsee, the one whom she supports, and she held her hands up as though she was holding both of their hands and described this as her lifeline, this simultaneous experience of holding and being held that we participate in all the time. It's perhaps the, the place where the spirit hovers and the life of Trinity can be entered into. And here we start to see what world-changing, honest, courageous community can look like. I was in a casual conversation recently with an All Saints parishioner at a meeting where this person was sharing with me about her young niece, a four-year-old who was having surgery the next day. And maybe a minute went by in the conversation and she said, thank you, I feel so much better. And I thought, thank you for what? I didn't do anything. Yet here's the truth. Something mystical happens when vulnerability meets even the slightest bit of loving attention. 
It is as though reality awaits the circuits of love to be connected where the life of Trinity can be known. And it is a reminder to not lose heart in doing even the simplest and seemingly small acts of care because there is far more going on than what we can see. Where we are conditioned to fight against and try to conquer our weakness and shame, the good news of the Jesus narrative this morning is that we actually slay the beast of life by owning and embracing that which we perceive as shameful and letting it be our gift that binds us most deeply together. And to only do this with company that can bear these pearls of great price. This is the place where radical grace can be known, where in the words of Richard Rohr, we stop counting or we stop trying to win in both blatant and disguised ways. We stop needing an enemy in order to have an identity, an enemy in ourselves or anyone else. And this is the place where the possibility of justice arises out of bold relationality and compassionate seeing. And finally, we realize deep in our bones that there has never, ever been anything to prove. Hear that this morning. There has never, ever been anything to prove, not to your mother or to your father or other authority figures or especially to God. There is only a dance to be restored and experienced by everyone on the planet. The quest for authentic embodied community is very real in our world today, especially in this time, in this liminal time in the life of all saints. May we perceive the vast well of radical grace that this community, you and I, have to offer the world. We are a gathering of people centered on a narrative of spirituality, community, and peace and justice, animated by rituals and sacraments centered in the revolutionary life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. We are emotionally connected through music and impelled into action by various programs and opportunities. And we are also avid users of many forms of social media. And last but not least, we are a beautiful crowd that any artist would love to photograph. For all these reasons, may we be fearless and excited for all the newness that is to come. Amen.